So the next speaker is uh, Maya Petkova, uh, postdoc of the Center of Astronomy of Heidelberg University. And she will talk uh, about uh, complex multi-scale structures in uh, simulated and observed emission maps of the BRIC protocluster cloud. Thank you very much. Uh, I just like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work here today. Uh, and I also have to add that I'm quite excited to be presenting at a conference that I happen to be sharing a name with. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about the central molecular zone of the Milky Way. So for those of you who might not be familiar, uh, this is the innermost few hundred parsecs of our galaxy. Uh, where the, the center of the galaxy is right about here. And uh, this is a region that presents us with a unique opportunity for, for studying um, unusual star formation, and I would even say extreme star formation within our own galaxy. Uh, so what is, what is special about the, the central molecular zone, as the name suggests, is that it contains a huge reservoir of molecular, dense molecular gas, uh, but it massively underperforms in terms of star formation rate. And this is something that is not yet fully understood why it happens. And the, the thing is that there are so many different uh, ways in which the CMZ is different from the solar neighborhood that, that we are more used to and that we understand better in terms of star formation process. But it's really not clear what's, what's going on and what is important there. So for example, in this region, we have higher temperatures, pressure and densities than in the solar neighborhood clouds and in the disk altogether. We also have strong magnetic fields and high rates of cosmic rays. And on top of that, the, the, the galactic potential within this region is quite steep, which means that it drives strong shear and tidal forces that these clouds are subjected to. So all of these components could be important for this unusually low star formation rate that we see. Um, but one hypothesis that we had was that it is indeed the effects of the galactic potential that play a very crucial role in shaping the clouds and hence uh, affecting the star formation. So um, here is what we base our hypothesis on. So if we think about whether or not shear is important within this region, we can compare the velocity dispersion that a typical uh, realized cloud would have with the velocity dispersion that we would expect the shear would drive. And here you, you see two different expressions for shear, um, just with, with different numerical values, one for, this, for the CMZ and one for the solar neighborhood. And by comparing these two numbers, uh, we could derive a criterion for, for the densities that, that would be affected by shear in these two different environments. And we see that in the solar neighborhood, um, we have relatively low densities. So this would be like the, the warm neutral medium that would be affected by shear. Whereas in the CMZ, we really have uh, gas at much higher densities that we expect to see effects on um, driven by the shear. So, so far so good, we have, we have a reasonable hypothesis that the shear should be important um, in, in this region, but how do we test that? So one way to go forward here would be to run numerical simulations as we've done here. So what we have here are clouds that are moving on an orbit around the galactic center. So the, you can see here the orbit in, a, in this uh, dotted line. And as the clouds are moving along this, this orbit, they're experiencing the external gravitational potential of the galaxy and also their own self-gravity. And we haven't added any other fancy physics. So it's, um, it's really quite simple. It's only those two effects. And this was deliberate so that we could really isolate the effects of the galactic potential. And uh, what we find here is that um, our relatively simple clouds are managing to reproduce a lot of the observables of the real CMZ clouds. So here on the right, you can see in the, in the gray shaded areas are the values that we get from our simulations and the, uh, and, and the black individual data points are, are the values from the real CMZ clouds. And we see pretty good agreement in terms of the column density and also the line of sight velocity dispersion. And um, 
In addition to, to those two observables, we also see good agreement with the line of sight velocity gradient, and as well as the aspect ratio of the clouds. So overall, we see that the more global properties of these clouds are well matched by our, by our uh, simulations. But of course, star formation um, happens on much smaller scales. And therefore, we also need to see if the substructure within these clouds also matches what we see in observations. And in order to look into that, we have then selected just one of these CMZ clouds called the brick. So it's the one over here in this, in this circle. And uh, what is special about the brick is that it is one of the densest and most quiescent clouds in the CMZ. So it's really in, in this state of just about to start forming stars. So it's, it's uh, ideal for studying the properties of the gas before we need to worry about any stellar feedback or any such things. So uh, it is ideal for our purposes. And in addition, uh, we, have, uh, we have existing uh, AMO observations from cycle zero of the brick. So the cloud has been very extensively studied within the literature. So uh, in order to compare our, uh, one of our simulations, the one that, that represents the brick to the real brick, we need to do some further processing because what we get from a simulation is we have some uh, three-dimensional volume and we have density information for each point in space. But of course, this is not what we observe with the telescope. What we observe with the telescope is the light emitted from this cloud. And in order to be able to have this more direct comparison between the simulation and the observation, we have then post-processed this, uh, this simulation with line radius transfer um, to create these emission maps that you see here for different molecular tracers. And at this point, I should say that uh, this work has been submitted. It's not yet published, but if you're interested, you can look it up on the archive because it's on the archive. Uh, yes, and so once we have these, uh, these emission maps from the different molecular tracers, we then post-process this further in order to account for the beam effects from ALMA. So we do further post-processing with CASA in order to really reproduce the observational setup that we have from the real observations. And, and this is the, the different images that we have in the different molecular tracers. And as you can see, they, they, some of them kind of look alike. Some of them uh, look a little bit more distinct. And this is something that you could see better when we combine them. So over here. So we were quite happy to see that while there is reasonable correlation between the different molecular lines, there's also some degree of decorrelation, which is also something that was, uh, that was observed in the real brick. Um, and even though in the real brick, there was even further decorrelation between the different molecular tracers and the fact that we don't see this, this to the same degree in the simulations is likely caused by um, you know, relatively simple chemical modeling. But so now we have our synthetic observation and we're ready to compare its structure to, to the real observed brick. And in order to do that, we've, we've used several different ways to quantify structure. So here we see uh, the spatial power spectrum and the fractal dimension. And for both of those, we see very good agreement between the simulation and the observations. So, so far, so good. But when we've looked at other, uh, other ways of quantifying structure, such as the density PDF and the moments of inertia of the individual substructures within, within these clouds, um, we do see some discrepancies. And uh, this is indicative that while we can reproduce the global properties of the clouds pretty well just by considering the galactic potential, when we really want to reproduce the smaller scale structures, we need extra physics. And one bit of extra physics that our results are starting to hint towards is that perhaps it would be quite crucial to include magnetic fields. So, this is our prediction going forward. In addition to the, the spatial structure of these observations, we have also looked at the kinematic structure. So here we're looking at the size line width relation, which captures the dynamical states of the gas. And for a virialized cloud, we expect a slope of a half. 
And indeed, in the solar neighborhood, for example, this is uh, this is the kind of slope that we get. Uh, but here we see that uh, both the simulated and the observed prick actually has uh, actually have much steeper slope of this relation. Uh, and what is remar remarkable here is that actually not only are these slopes steeper, but they they are really very similar. And this is not something that we put into the simulation. We just uh, let the clou clouds evolve, evolve along the orbit. So um, this is quite strong indication that the effects of this shear um, are causing the steep steepening of the size line with relation. And uh, one explanation of what's happening here is that the shear really pulls apart the cloud. So it manages to start to spin it. And because it induces this rotation within the cloud, we have a boosted velocity dispersion for, for the larger spatial scales. And indeed, we see this rotation if we look at the line of sign velocities. So this is these are histograms of the first moment maps of the simulated and the, and the, and the observed prick. And we again see that they look remarkably similar. And we, they both have this, oh, I'm sorry, they both have this uh, double uh, peaked structure, which is indicative exactly of this rotation that I was talking about. And finally, we've also looked at the turbulent state of the clouds uh, as described by this parameter on the y-axis here. So whenever we measure a small value of this parameter, we, um, th this is indicative of having solenoidal turbulence within the cloud, and a high value of this parameter is indicative of having predominantly compressive turbulence within the cloud. And as you can see, um, the values that we get from the simulation within the ranges we would typically measure this are very comfortably within the solenoidal range, um, predominantly solenoidal range. Uh, and so is the, the estimated value for this parameter for the real brick. So this is really coming together um, with, uh, with a picture where the shear is driving this rotation and it's also injecting solenoidal, solenoidal turbulence within the cloud. And it is perhaps exactly this lack of compressive turbulent modes within the, the cloud that may be contributing to the low star formation rate. Three minutes. Thank you. Uh, so I'm only going, um, so now I, I explained to you uh, what we, uh, we have learned in the brick from our simulations and observations. And I am now going to just take a minute to tell you what's coming up in the future. So uh, we have now this upcoming Alma Large program called ACES, which has been approved and it's now starting to collect data. So we're really excited about this because ACES will be able for the first time to map the entire gas reservoir of the, of the CMZ instead of just uh, having this uh, patchy picture. So here you see in orange are the regions that have been mapped with ALMA in the past. So they're just individual regions, whereas now we're going to have the full gas reservoir that is going to be able to show us the gas flow from really from the large scales to the smallest scales. And uh, this is going to enable um, studies like the one that I just talked to you about um, for many of the other clouds within this region. And this brings me to my conclusions. So I showed you that the galactic potential plays a crucial role in shaping the gas structure and kinematics in the CMZ, and that by including the galactic potential in hydrodynamic simulations, we can reproduce global structural and kinematic properties of the CMZ clouds. And, um, and uh, also on smaller scales, we need additional physics in order to reproduce the structure. And finally, just a final reminder, ACES is coming, so stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. You did a very impressive work on the simulation with, the, with Alma. Thank you very much. Thank you you explained very well the complexity of uh, this uh, central molecular zone and the peculiarity of um, the brick cloud. So uh, we already had some questions in the chat. So yes, yeah, so thank you for this very nice and clear talk. So we have at, it's actually a long question, so I will do it slowly. So we mentioned that one of the limitations of the simulation at small scales is maybe the lack of physics regarding magnetic fields. So the question is, um, 
about the feedback. Could this be another aspect to consider? Because uh, outflow or other possible shocks included, in, uh, sorry, are the outflows or other possible shocks included in the simulation? And uh, from, there's just a note that from uh, recent observations, there are some evidence that there are a number of signatures pointing to shocks in the bricks that have been discovered recently. So what about my, um, shocks and feedback in the simulation? So feedback at this point has not been included in the simulation. Um, in any case, uh, of course, the, the feedback that is more likely to, to cause significant disruption in the structure of the cloud would be um, uh, ionizing feedback or, or supernovae, because of course these, these have a much, these are much more impactful. And uh, there is some evidence that perhaps there could be some uh, hidden H2 region within the brick, uh, but so far it's relatively tentative. Uh, but uh, indeed what we see is only very early stages of star formation. So um, at least uh, while this would be important perhaps for the very small scales, I don't think that would be so crucial for, for example, parastic scales, which is also scales on which I see some discrepancies. In any case, it looks like a very complicated region, so. Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay, I have a, another question here. Great talk. So there were hints from Chandra data of enhanced activity from the central supermassive black hole. In your radiative transfer computation, did you study the possible impact of past X-ray illumination propagate, propagating through the CMZ? No, so, so far our chemical modeling is uh, relatively simple. So we, we only took um, um, uh, like um, what would be reasonable abundance for each of the molecular tracers and reasonable temperature for, for the cloud that we have from, from observational data. But we haven't really considered any variations of any of those. So this is a relatively early stage of, of this type of work. And this is something that we will be looking forward, uh, we will be looking into going forward, especially with ACES. Uh, but this was really like a, a first step in this direction. I have a curiosity. You said that you use um, existing ALMA data. Um, are there archival data or uh, what kind of data you did you use? Also the um, uh, properties like uh, sensitivity or angular resolution, and what will be the difference between uh, the, the used uh, ALMA data and the uh, assess new data that uh, you will have? Oh, sorry, I wanted to go to the ACES slide. So the, the existing ALMA data is from cycle zero. Uh, the angular resolution is actually quite uh, comparable to, the, to what we have with ACES. Um, it's also band three. Um, I am afraid that I cannot answer the, the sensitivity question of the top of my head. Um, um, but yes, so 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 it will be it will be quite quite comparable in terms of uh, angular resolution. Uh, but also, of course, with this uh, cycle zero data, we don't have any of the of the larger scales because we we just have. Uh, the AMA data with, without the compact array and without the top, total power. So this will be something that will come with ACES. Okay. We have time for one more question. Yes, I have one more in the chat. So great talk. Do you know if we can learn more about the CMZ structure by comparing with nearby galaxies, for example, M31? So of course we could don't get the similar resolution, but maybe low resolution crude comparison with nearby galaxy centers could help. Uh, so there are people who are already studying other galactic centers. Um, I don't know if M31 is a, a good analog of, of what they, we see in the Milky Way. I'm, I'm just not familiar with this. Um, but uh, yes, there's definitely efforts towards uh, imaging other galactic centers, uh, also with ALMA. So I think there are some, there, there could be some very nice synergies going forward. Thank you, Maya, again. Thank you.